Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Vedic Conversation. Our guest this week is Jeff Kober, who's based in Los Angeles, where he teaches meditation and works as an actor, photographer, and writer. I first met Jeff in India when he was giving me instructor training in 2017. I was immediately struck by his breadth of knowledge and interest in an application of metaphysics, questions related to what it is for something to exist and what types of existence there are. In the conversation today, Jeff reveals how this determines his outlook and approach to all aspects of his wide-ranging and busy life. I'm Anthony Thompson, a Vedic meditation teacher based in London, and I'm joined by my colleagues Rory Kinsella in Sydney and Derek Yanford in New York. Let's dive into the conversation, and don't forget to stick around to the end, where we offer an exercise in how you can apply this knowledge in your daily life. He's a busy man indeed. And we're so pleased and excited for this opportunity to have him as our guest on this episode of the Vedic Conversation. Welcome, Jeff. Oh, thank you so much, man. So good to see you, Anthony. It's, it's been great too to long. see you, Jeff. <laughs> I, was, I was just telling stories about you last week. I graduated, my uh, uh, associate and I graduated 10 new students of, uh, 10 new teachers of Vedic meditation. And I, I told them about some of our adventures testing in <laughs> along the banks of Maganga. <laughs> Gosh, we had a good time. Oh, yeah, we did actually. We we were in such a beautiful place. It was yeah. it was wonderful, and we were very fortunate. We were very fortunate. Absolutely. So, Jeff, you're interested, I know, in studying metaphysics, questions relating to what it is for something to exist and what types of existence there are. Uh, how is this reflected in your approach to meditation and teaching meditation? Well, it, it, first of all, I got into metaphysics because I was I had such a I was having such an awful experience of life um and nothing I seemed did on the outside seemed to affect that experience at all so I had to start working on the inside and uh that's what metaphysics to me simply means um I guess, what is it that I can't touch but that I can affect? What can I change that will change my experience of life? Um, and, uh, you know, so when I, when I teach meditation and my approach to meditation itself is, uh, you know, we're, we're learning our own system. We're, you know, I, uh, there's a certain group I belong to where they talk about, uh, yeah, when they handed out the owner's manual, I was behind the door. Um, I missed out on it. And so meditation and self-examination, it's about really seeing how this thing works, how this whole life experience works. And, uh, you know, what do I, where, where are the tabs that if I pull on them, they shift my experience of life and, and how do I do that? And how do I do that consistently? And, and how do I do that so that it shifts me and changes me over the long term? And my, my approach to teaching is basically this is what works for me. You might want to try this. Um, so it's, I, I'm not speaking from any place of I got this. You know, I, I'm speaking from a place of just for today, I'm a couple steps ahead of you. So let's go with that. Mm. Mm. And does it, do you also use this approach in your writing, photography, acting, and music making? Um, <clears throat> In, in, in those, okay, so acting is really interesting. Right now I'm, I, I am on this, this show, General Hospital. It just makes me giggle. Today I was named one of the top 15 new talents on, on uh, soap operas. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> my friend was, I was number five. My friend was 15. He got started a little later than I did. Um, it, but it's, it's it, soap operas for, you know, here, huh, the great thing about acting, acting is one of the most profound spiritual practices ever conceived uh, in that no one gets into acting without needing approval. And anyone who's seeking approval cannot be a good actor. So you, you get in there and then you find out, is there, okay, so approval doesn't work. Is there any other reason I'm doing this? Apparently, yes. And then you keep doing it. And then you, you seek to go past that 
needing approval voice into what's real and, and what's, what's really you and what really wants to happen there. And, and then you seek an experience of flow. And that my approach to life is I want to, I don't want to be careful. I don't want to figure it out. I don't want to know what I'm going to say before I open my mouth. I want to throw myself into the unknown and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so acting is, is the ideal uh, experience, you know, uh, uh, format within which to do that. And then as you meditate, you go along, you stop needing approval. You stop needing anything from outside yourself. So it becomes progressively easier to throw yourself into the unknown and i'm just having uh, a hoot right now doing doing the job i'm doing because it, the last day i worked which was the friday before thanksgiving i had 40 pages of dialogue and the two of them were that i had a, a one page monologue and a two page monologue and and you, you do it you do it once you know they have four cameras. You they say you you stand here, you go over there. You you ready? Okay, and action. And then you do it once. They okay, moving on. And <laughs> it's absurd <laughs> in the extreme. And you've got to remember forty pages of dialogue. And the the trap is just trying to survive that. The challenge is, can I make this real and alive? Can I step into the next moment without knowing what I'm going to say and make it real and actually be speaking to somebody? And that's just, that. you know, I, I don't know why, but at this point in my life, I just, there are so many things that I used to care about that I don't care about. These are all good things to cease caring about so that I'm just having fun throwing myself into it. And uh, so I don't, it's not exactly the same approach, but it is the approach of, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's try this. And am I right in thinking that you use the Meissner technique where you sort of get out of your head and, and behave instinctively to the kind of environment? So it's a very immediate, instinctive, intuitive reaction. It is. And I'll, I'll just uh, add a couple of things to what you said, which is, yes, exactly. It's a way of getting out of your head. Meissner called it living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. So living truthfully is, is job one. And how many of us have spent times in our lives not living truthfully, right? So you've got to, you've got to examine all this in here so that you don't care if it's seen out here. That's job one. And then instead of living in my head wondering what you're thinking of me or making up what you're thinking of me and living in my thoughts about your thoughts about me, uh, instead I just put all of my attention on you and then life naturally comes out of me. And if I were saying, I love you to you, Anthony, it's going to come out in a completely differently than if I said it to Rory or if I said it to Derek. It, it, and anyone listening would go like, they would, they would hear something differently. They would have a different experience. They would, the relationship would be um, illustrated in some fashion or uh, exposed in some fashion via that. And, and then you don't have to figure it out. So it's, it's like... Uh, it's like life really concentrated. It's concentrated life. And they happen to have a camera that's capturing it. <laughs> and for me, I just, I never watch myself. So uh, I, I never get self-conscious <laughs> because if I ever saw what I looked like doing this, it would probably horrify me and I'd stop. So, Do you never watch the programs when they're being transmitted? No. No, almost, almost never. I've, I've watched... I watched. I did a couple of movies in the last few years. I've watched. Uh, there's one that's. Uh, there's a. Uh, oh, there's two. <laughs> I I was in uh, Sully. I worked with Clint Eastwood. I was I was Sully's first uh, flight instructor. I've never seen that movie. I I just. I, I can't. <laughs> I spend all of my time not being self-conscious, so I, I just I don't want to add anything in there that's going to... Besides, it would bore me. It would horrify me. <clears throat> but you also spend time behind the camera. Now, when we were in India in 2017, when we used to go for those beautiful walks every afternoon, mm -hmm. um, which were sort of such an essential part of our day, we were, we were training and 
doing a lot of intensive learning, but then to spend whatever it was, 40 minutes to an hour walking yeah. out into the countryside, into that beautiful agricultural landscape, and you always with your camera mm -hmm. and just cracking off shots left, right and center, you'd suddenly see something and, and you'd just go for it. And you very, very sweetly shared your uh, portfolio with us when we got back. And then there are some staggeringly beautiful photographs. Oh, thank you, man. And you're, I know you're very interested in collodion photography, that the, the tin type mm -hmm. photography, which yeah. I think after that trip to India, you went off somewhere in India to meet some people who were specialists in that or? Uh, I, no. Uh, did I get Adi that wrong? Uh, well, no. You, 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 I did go off to meet Aditya Arya, uh, who uh, had the largest collection of uh, photographic paraphernalia and cameras in India, um, mm. and now ha and was working on this at the time, and now uh, is the curator of a museum of photography in one of the uh, outlying areas of New Delhi. Um, I went to show him how to do wet plate collodion. <laughs> it didn't go well. There, there was <laughs> no no images were formed. Oh dear! Because the chemistry there was just like it, 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 collodion is. Uh, I don't know. It's seen as bomb making material or something. There, it might have changed by now. But the stuff that they had was not was not conducive to taking photographs. And what is it about that particular technique that that, that you like? Uh, well, again, it's it's stepping into the unknown. Uh, for those uh, the, for the uninitiated, uh, wet plate collodion or tintype or ambrotype photography was invented in 1851. It was uh, preceded only by daguerreotype. Um, all the pictures you see of uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, from the Civil War, all of those photographs are. Um, wet plate collodion photographs. Uh, it's an extraordinarily slow process. Um, and the uh, you're making a photographic emulsion for every single plate you shoot. And uh, the, f the way the chemistry reacts and the way the light reacts to the chemistry and, and vice versa uh, shifts and changes based upon the temperature, the age of the chemistry, the, the time of day, it, it, it uh, reacts to actinic light or blue light, which is in the morning. It doesn't react to red light, which is in the afternoon. So, and all these things uh, determine how long the exposure is, what it's going to look like, and there's, there's like a thousand ways to screw it up. And, and as a photographer, you do, you screw them, a lot of them, you, you find them all. Um, and so stepping into the unknown and seeing what happens and looking, you know, this is all of these things that I do are, uh, they're all about process rather than product. And, and this is how this ties into the metaphysical, uh, theories that I study and, uh, and uh, explore is that, you know, we look at ourselves, we humans look at ourselves so often as a product. If I just lose enough weight, get enough money, find the right partner, if I only I were younger, if whatever, if I were the right product, then I'd be okay. And life, we are not products, we are processes. And, uh, and learning how to be a better product does not necessarily at all uh, lend itself to making me a better process. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I want, I'm practicing process all the time because if it doesn't work, why am I studying it? Why am I teaching it? Why am I trying to find out more about it? So I, I have to challenge myself to, you know, be the process whenever I can. Uh, so that's that's such a, <clears throat> a great way of describing it. I, if I think about my group meditations, it's I'm talking about process every time, and it's it's one of those ones that's worth just going. Look, okay, I'm I'm going to be in the process of repeating this every time because it's so easy to forget because we want you know whether it's through our upbringing or upbringing or whatever it is, we we want to to be that finished product we want to 
succeed in everything, but it's going back into that um, beginner mindset. I guess why thinking of photography, the type of photography you're talking about is different to digital photography, say, where you can, you can take a hundred shots and you can look at them all and wait for them to be perfect. Yeah. And find the one out of 100 that actually works. And th this one, no, you're, you're stuck with a, <laughs> a plate that looks like crap, you know, and, and if you want to try again, you can, but everything has to align uh, perfectly. And, and then you're, you're also, you're, uh, you're also teaching yourself continually that perfection only uh, exists uh, within the moment, within the process, within the flow. There is perfect flow. There's no perfect stasis. Because as soon as it's perfect, it's, it's, already, fall, it's already falling away. So yeah. it's, like, it's like finding the perfect way of riding a bicycle. You know, uh, how, how much weight do you put on the right side versus the left? And if you're going around a left-hand corner, well, you know, if I have this kind of tire, is it... Yeah, you know, it's like, it's, it's absurd. You get on a bike and you ride it, you know? And so the way, most, uh, the way I used to try to live life was I thought you guys all knew how to do it, and I was trying desperately to catch up. And... Uh, then I either got to the point where I realized no one else knew how to do it or I no longer cared. <laughs> I'm not sure which. Maybe a combination of the two. I, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up um, because I'm, I'm a little bit more curious hearing from you specifically and not to be anything other than transparent. I've heard different stories about you. From oh, no. <laughs> no, all good. All good. But from from your mouth could you maybe describe a little bit in detail life before finding meditation for you? oh well um and in full transparency from me i'm uh, uh, the the book that i'm just about finished writing now is called the end of the pain factory and uh just the the short version of what that means is i i used to live in a state of uh, just inner torture um, because things that happened I, I was in a, involved in a, a, a fatal car accident when I was 15 and um, I was it was it was a true accident I wasn't charged I wasn't at fault but no one ever told me that and then people treated me or at least I thought they treated me as if I were uh, no longer worthy of life and so I treated myself that way and um, I, you know, I, I became lost for many years. I joined a carnival. I worked in a factory. I traveled around, hitchhiked around the country. Um, I, I just, I put myself in really bad situations repeatedly because that's where I belonged. And I took lots of uh, uh, drugs and alcohol to numb myself because I couldn't stand the way it felt to be alive. And I couldn't find a way to kill myself. Um, and somewhere in there, you know, life will not be denied. Do you know, m people, just to, just to bring up a cheery subject, let's talk about suicide for a moment. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, and when they try to shoot themselves from under their uh, chin, they blow the front of their face off. You know why? Because as you're pulling the trigger, life says no and moves the gun so that you don't die. You know, people who throw themselves off of high uh, uh, buildings or, or precipices, um, they, they almost always land, you know, uh, face up rather than and feet down because they're trying not to splatter. You know, it, once, when you take yourself to that level, life says no. And so the same thing was true with me. At a certain point, life said, no, you can't do that. And I had to begin the long, arduous task of learning how to be alive. And, uh, and then, and somewhere in there, I, you know, I stopped being able to get drunk or high. So I stopped using drugs and alcohol that's not like and then i stopped using drugs and alcohol it's just it, that was a long process too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then i and and i worked i had 
I tried again quite desperately to change my experience of life and to change the way I saw myself and to change the way the voice in my head was speaking to me and the story it was telling me about myself. And um, I, I got back to about 70% of life. I don't know where I got that figure, but that's the way it felt to me. And, um, and it was like I was 47 or 48. I, I finally just said, you know what, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. If it hasn't changed by now, it's not going to change. So just stop. Just stop. This is going to have to be good enough. You know, 70% of a lot, you know, because I, I was one of those people with a lot of potential when I was a kid. 70% of a lot is, that's got to be good enough. Um, sort of like the Australian dollar. Um, <laughs> it's like... <laughs> So I was an Australian dollar in the U.S. economy. and uh, We were 110 once. You were. I so remember. Uh, I do remember. I, I was there at that time. It was awful. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and uh, uh, about six weeks after I just quit trying, I learned Vedic meditation. And I checked in with myself a year later and that 70% figure was gone. It was, I, had, I was at 100% and climbing. Mm. And not like I was becoming better than anyone else, but that I was actually in the game of, uh, of, of having a life, of learning to uh, move in the direction of the joy of living. Mm. And, and uh, that's one of our deepest, most profound um, assignments, I believe, is to find a way to live joyfully. Beautiful. Did you seek out meditation or did, did somebody introduce you to it or did you stumble You know what, I had, I had tried, med I'd been med when I learned Vedic meditation, I'd already been meditating for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Vipassana, mindfulness, um, uh, there was a group called Ananda Marga many years ago that was uh, Indian based and um, I tried all these things, and, and all of them were ways to try to control the thinking in some fashion or another. And, you know, it's, it's, you can't control the thing. In the Bhagavad Gita, they talk about that, and it's like trying to control, you know, uh, wild horses um, or the wind. You, it's just, it's impossible. Um, and meditation had done something for me, but it hadn't been transformational. And then my wife heard from a friend of ours that there was this, uh, this meditation where you got a word, you listened to it quietly inside, and it made you happy. And, mm -hmm. I said, and she said, there's this guy, he's, he's going to talk about it. And I said, let me know how that <laughs> works out for you. <laughs> because I was, I was cynical, I was bitter, I was like, and he's going to want money, and... and uh, and I, I, she, I agreed finally to go with her, and we went to. Uh, did you ever know Will Dalton, you guys? No, he, not he, personally. But we he know just passed a, a few months ago. Yeah, um, and uh, we went to Will Dalton's home in West Hollywood, and Will met us at the uh, in in the courtyard, and he was, you know, a, a shaven-headed, beautiful uh, Australian man with skin-tight jeans and a, a crisp white shirt, and. He was just way too smiley for my taste. And we walked inside and I looked around at the people and, and at the pictures of, you know, orange suited, orange robed uh, individuals. And before the teacher even came out to speak, I just said, yeah, I'm out of here. I'll pick you up in an hour. And Adele said, no, I'll leave with you. And so we left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Will went, what? I, uh, thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> And my friend said, you're a loser. You got to go listen to this guy. <laughs> so a month later, the guy came back and I went and listened to him. And, uh, and you know, and I, I, I liked what he had to say, but I didn't, I, I wasn't going to learn. And my friend gave me, Tom Knowles uh, was the teacher, and he gave me his number and I called him up. And he said, so what are your issues? I said, uh, well, First of all, why should I trust you? <laughs> I don't know you. He said, "Well, don't trust me. Trust your experience. How did you feel, you know, when you were when you were listening?" And uh, I said, "Well, I, I felt 
I guess I felt good. And he said, and I said, also, I didn't think you're supposed to have to pay for spiritual teachings. He said, okay, I, I, that's a common uh, uh, idea. He said, the truth is you can't pay for this practice. It's priceless. And, uh, and Will and I actually did thought experiments about this later. He said, okay, Jeffo, if I gave you a million dollars, would you stop meditating? I said, no, go away. <laughs> Ten million. I said, yeah, piss off. And, you know, and so it is priceless. It really, there was no figure that would get me to quit meditating. And he said, what you're paying for is my availability as a teacher. If I didn't charge for this, I would have to, uh, you know, I don't know, he said, get a job in a hardware store in Flagstaff or something. He's making it up. He'd never worked a day in his life. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agreed and I came and learned and immediately something was different. Immediately there was something that it wasn't, I wasn't trying to change the way my mind worked. I began to experience myself as something other than the mind and the, other than the contents of the mind, mm. you know. And, and that's, that is, that's huge to someone who's uh, lived their life identified with their thinking, identified with their intelligence, identified with their capacity to understand what someone else uh, says or what they're thinking or how they see the world. You know, when you're lost, you're looking for someone to show you the way. And so you read these things by philosophers, teachers. Sri Aurobindo was a huge one for me. And you're trying to find, explain it to me to where I can get it. And then I'll take notes and I'll do it the way you're telling me to. And meditation gave me a way to discover the way this machine works. And to begin to use this one, you know, and to become an expert on this. And there's, you know, a big Venn diagram crossover between what this, how this works and how the rest of humanity works. It's not, a, it's not identical, but um, I'm an expert in me now. So, who are the other teachers that have been influential for you? I know that you often in your in your posts you you quote uh, David Hawkins and Sri M. Yeah, da these. David Hawkins, uh, extraordinary uh, psychologist uh, who became enlightened. Perhaps was I think he he claims he talked about having enlightenment experiences as a child, but. Then he was a, a psychologist who so he knew about the mind. So his talking about consciousness and the mind and the intellect in a way that uh, really is was easy for me to understand or uh, enlightening for me to understand. Uh, and Sri M, Sri M is just a a dear individual who, you know, he wrote his book because his teacher told him he had to many years ago. And he put it out when he put it out so that anyone who wanted to meet him could still do it while he was in the body, you know. And the first time I went to see him was in 2013 in a place called Brighton Bush, Oregon. And, um, and he, it looked like he'd rather be any place other than where he was. He, the last thing he wanted to do was being sitting in Brighton Bush teaching a bunch of Westerners about uh, Kriya Yoga and meditation. And I was with him in uh, 2018. Uh, we went to Badranath with him up into the Himalayas. And, um, and I got to interview him there <clears throat> for this movie that uh, his son-in-law was doing with him. And I asked him, I said, <laughs> Because And in between, I had gone on the Walk of Hope with him. The Walk of Hope, Sri M walked from the bottom of India to the top of India over a period of 16 months. Uh, he did a, it was a padiatra, uh, you know, a, a walking uh, sacrifice. And there were anywhere from 50 to 1,000 people walking with him at any given time, and I walked with him for a month. And, uh, and I, when I was interviewing him, I said, you know, you, you seem to be enjoying yourself a lot more talking to people today than you were in 2013. He said, oh, really? I, I said, yeah. yeah. It's just like that last talk you gave was just, you know, uh, I don't know if I said off the hook, but that's what I meant. <laughs> and, um, and he said, huh, it's interesting that you noticed that. And I said, it, it seems as if you've, uh, you know, because I said in Oregon, you looked like you'd, uh, for all the world, as if you'd rather be doing anything other than that. And I said, it looks like you've, maybe through the walk of hope, accepted your fate. 
And he just started laughing. He said, yeah, I get, you, you're right. I think I did. <laughs> so now he's enjoying being a teacher. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I've just, I've gained so much from uh, getting to study with him. And, um, you know, I, I learned a, a technique from him in Varanasi. I, I wanted him to teach me this technique, um, this esoteric technique. And uh, I asked him in 2013, he said, well, you know, come back in 2014, do this for a year and then come back in 2014, I'll teach you that thing. So I went back in 2014, he said, yeah, um, you know what, in Varanasi, meet me in Varanasi and uh, I'll teach you that mm-hmm. thing. So I walked with him for a month and because he said, why are you <laughs> why are you here? I said, well, you told me that if I met you in Varanasi, you'd teach me that thing. And I thought it would just be rude to show up. So I thought, I'll walk for a month, you know, it's like a sweat equity. And he said, <laughs> okay. And, and then we got together in Varanasi, and he, he taught me something, but not what I was looking for. But when he was going to teach me this thing, here's the point of this, this story, um, or this part of the story, I asked one of his guys who, like, kept people away from him and, you know, organized, one of the organizers, I said, so what should I, uh, Shriam's going to teach me this thing, or Sir, that's what everyone calls it. I said, Sir is going to teach me this thing. What should I give him? And he said, I'll get back to you. And he, the next day he came to me, he said, uh, so I talked to Sir, and uh, he said, uh, one flower and one rupee. And as you know, a rupee is worth two cents. Um, and it's, this is what, you know, Nike uh, wanted to uh, sponsor his Walk of Hope. And he said, what would that entail? And he said, well, we, they, you know, we would put bo- billboards up. We'd give everyone shoes, you know, and, but we'd put billboards up with your message and then a little swoosh down at the bottom. He said, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, other, yeah, Pema Chodron has been really profoundly uh, interesting for me as well in that her, she talks about the willingness to stay in the discomfort of life. And there's a period of time in my experience where you wake up and then you have to get present in the body but not listen to the stories that the discomfort of your body is generating. Like the mind goes, um, you know, it's like I feel bad. And the mind goes, well, of course you feel bad. You are bad. Here's how you're bad. And then tells you all the things that you've told yourself for your entire life and maybe some new ones you've picked up along the way. <laughs> and, you know, and Pema Children just, she talks about living in the discomfort of life and in the ubiquitous anxiety of the universe. Um, that's, you know, she's, you know, as I'm sure you know, she's, a, you know, she's a, 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 a Buddhist nun in the, the Tibetan tradition, uh, Chogyam Trungpa. Um, uh, Rinpoche, uh, his tradition. And, um, you know, she goes away and meditates for months at a time, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And she describes experiences like we have in our 20 minutes twice a day practice. She's doing mindfulness and, and, and that sort of sitting in the silence thing. And so there's only one place to get to. She has a way of getting there. We have a way of getting there. Shri M has a way of getting there. Um, so uh, those those are the those are those are the big ones for me, I guess. Yeah. Eckhart Tolle too is is quite quite profound. And when did you realize that you wanted to become a teacher yourself? I didn't. I never did. I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, <clears throat> I. I was uh, I was an actor. I still am, and uh, I w- when I started doing the meditation with Tom Knowles, I, he would say these things that would just resonate as truth to me, and I'd go, "Oh, thank God!" And I would walk out the door, and I would forget what he said. <laughs> so I'd have to go back and hear it again, and then I and forget what he said. And you know, I'm from. Montana. I was raised on a farm. I'm, you know, this Protestant work ethic. I started going to all of his sessions and, you know, I started helping out. I'd clean up after they were over. I'd set up chairs before they began. I started helping Will sign people up. Then I started helping Tom, you know, do puja ceremonies. And, and uh, you know, we started hanging out. And 
and I watched him teach and watched him teach and watched him teach and, you know, critiqued him and, and, uh, and he critiqued himself. And, you know, we just, you know, we, uh, I sort of became his protege in a, in a sense. And, uh, and then he said, so I'm going to make some teachers. This was in 2007, or actually the end of 2006. He said, so you're, of course, going to be one of those. I said, no, man, I'm an actor. I don't, I don't he says, well, no, you, you need to be a teacher. And I said, look, I'm an actor. You're the guru. I want a pilot. Give me a pilot. And <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, look, you're, you're already a teacher just by hanging out and hearing too much and, and learning too much. He said, so the only question is, will you be a, a good teacher or a, an in, uninformed teacher? And he said, you can be both. And... <clears throat> so I did this three-month experience, the same as uh, I did with Anthony later, um, in Flagstaff, Arizona, and in India, where I became a teacher and where I went through the rigors of what we go through to become a teacher. And and this about halfway through, I said, okay, so when should I start planning what I'm going to do when I get out of here? He said, no, don't, just let it happen. I said, yeah, that's you can tell that to the to the civilians uh, but w when am I when should I do it and he said no no really don't I said okay fine and uh, a couple weeks later I called my sister in Montana and she burst into tears when I got on the phone I said oh you need to learn to meditate I'm coming up and I called the Dell said road trip and so we set up a, a I, I, I asked my sister if there was a yoga studio near where she was and there was one out in the country uh, a converted barn. Um, that's where I taught my first group uh, in July of 2007. So I set up an intro talk there in this uh, western Montana, and then I called a friend in eastern Montana in Billings and asked him for a yoga studio, and I got one there and gave a talk there. And I gave my intro talk, and the day I taught my first people in western Montana... I, my manager called and told me I was offered a movie that was going to begin the day after I would finish my second group of students at the other end of the state. And it was like, okay, I get it. You know, <laughs> you can't write that. You can't make that up. You can't plan for that. And it's just, you know, and, and it's just, that's what it's been basically is that, you know, when one is working, the other one isn't and one and vice versa, you know, and I'm able to do both by and large most of the time. So. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be a teacher. And, and as I'm sure you guys notice, is that the, you know, the teacher is the one who benefits the most. Because <laughs> you've got you've to embody that. This is, a, this is a bliss technique. I was a lifelong depressive. So I'd have to, like, bring myself back around to life every time people were at the door, you know? And so I, I, I and that's in, that's, it, it takes practice to enjoy yourself. So. But those depressing days of a long past, aren't they? They really are. Yeah, they are. I don't, I, I, I have moments of uh, irritation but those are few and far between, and they're really only moments. I'm not, de yeah, depression is just not a thing for me anymore. And mm -hmm. it's hard to remember that it ever was. So, so do, do you sort of recognize yourself as you are today? Well, it's, I, don't, I don't look at myself, Anthony. <laughs> 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 <So> you <said. laughs> <laughs> there's you know when you're identified as this thing you're self-centered and that means you're about this big looking back at yourself seeing how am i doing how am i doing how am i doing it's a very small constricted experience of life and everything that you do is based in fear because the ego animal nature is just trying to keep itself alive and it will tell you don't do it, it knows how to say no don't do that that's new that might hurt you don't do that and when you do this, as we've been doing it for this long, you instead of being self-centered, you start to become centered in the self. And from the self 
within, there's only looking outward. And, you know, so you'd have to stop and imagine yourself stepping outside and looking back at yourself in order to see how you were doing and in order to recognize the changes that you've made. And it's like, I got, I'm too busy. <laughs> and nothing would be served by that. You know, because I'm, I'm a lot older than I was when I started this thing. And I don't want to see that. That's not, <laughs> that's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the last director that said and we have it written here where you take your shirt off i said yeah no one wants to see that man but move <laughs> on <laughs> that's sort of the way i feel about the whole thing at this point uh, i have a question um in terms of the current state of affairs uh -huh. for our listeners who are maybe thinking about starting a practice or wherever they might be i'm i'm curious in terms of the pandemic, what would you say it's offered you or that you've discovered about yourself or life that maybe you wouldn't have had this pandemic not taken over the world? My, <clears throat> my life has changed very little, frankly, uh, from the pandemic. I'm blessed in that regard. I have this job that uh, started in January uh, intermittently, and then that it ended, you know, from March to sometime in August or September, whenever it was, like four months there. Um, and then we started back up again. And, and uh, so that's, uh, you know, this, and, and when I'm not acting, I'm doing my photography. And when I'm not doing my photography, I'm teaching meditation, you know, so I, I got to take some time off from teaching meditation. Um, I, I've watched it affect others, but I, I've been so fortunate in, you know, not having to worry about putting bread on the table and and you know, uh, not having, uh, not being sick myself, not having people around me be sick. Um, what what have you what have you learned? <laughs> Interestingly, for me because I'm relatively new in terms of being a teacher. And I was so excited to be teaching and bringing this knowledge to people. I would say one of the things that I, that I discovered was the limitation I have in terms of being a Vedic meditation teacher and that we teach in person. Mm -hmm. And I'm so eager to share what I know with everyone. And I, so I guess, Part of that, what I've learned is the patience that I need to embody, then knowing that this will not be forever. And hopefully all of that enthusiasm that I've gained through the process of not doing it will deliver an even better experience that I could ever imagine not having had this experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I'm also in the process of, finding ways to bring this knowledge in a way that maybe is not within the Vedic context because I recognize how important it is and how yeah. how in in the regular world that we'll never go back to, our ability to do that was unhampered. And now this, for me, is asking me to either re-examine or find a way to innovate and deliver this, this beauty that you have yeah. with others. Because if anything, the pandemic is the, is the world screaming, we have got to get more people meditating. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so for me, yeah. it's like, I am so raring to go. Well, uh, it's, I, I imagine you guys too have asked yourselves, uh, is, is, are we going to keep doing it? Is it status quo or not? And when do you decide it's not going to ever go back to what it was and you can't do it the way you once did it? And, and you know, and I, cause I, and I know a lot of people have been teaching online who, one of our colleagues that learned with you is now teaching online. And a lot of people I know are teaching online and a lot of people are not. And, you know, the question is, is there, isn't it? It's, it's there in the air. What am I going to do with this, and how can I do this 
in a way that is 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 respectful of the tradition but is also offering to people who you know are on their own and i would definitely say that this podcast is a birth of that frustration Mm -hmm. you know this is a way for us to engage people in another way who are already currently meditating who are interested in it we want to provide content knowledge so this is you know the the best supplement you know that i think we could come up for for the time being um which is great because i don't know that i would have a podcast and have you on the show (laughs) if if we didn't have it so you know there's beauty in all of it and i know that that nature has it all figured out. I just, I think what's what's interesting about what you shared though is this, um, that, that with consistent meditation practice, we're able to handle the pandemic. We're able to handle anything because we're, we're this adaptable. So I'd love to hear that you're like, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm still cruising. It's great. <laughs> you know, that's just, the, it speaks to the power of this practice. Well, it's, it's, and I, I really, uh, I really uh, mention always that yeah, I know this is not the case for so many people, and I know that I'm just I'm really blessed in this regard. And um, and uh, you're right. This practice gives me an experience of life where I'm discovering what it's like today rather than looking at today with an idea of how it's supposed to be and comparing it to what it actually is and trying to move the one in the direction of the other. Mm, Beautiful. And that's where we get stuck. So many of us are like, I'm going to be okay as soon as. Right. And then I keep looking at what is to see if it's moving toward as soon as or away from as soon as. Mm -hmm. And if it's moving toward it, then I can be a little bit Okay, if it's moving away from it, then I start to panic and I get anxious. And most of the things we do to move, uh, to move now into as soon as, in the direction of as soon as, is, is about as effective as what we do when we're trying to um, make the bowling ball go differently than it's headed <laughs> when we've thrown it down the alley. <laughs> All that kind of movement like that. <laughs> all you do is put your back out and it never changes the trajectory of the ball at all so. yeah. Yeah. perfect in this episode Jeff raised some important points about how we regard ourselves we often make the mistake in the way we live our lives by seeing ourselves as a product rather than process and understanding that learning to be a better product doesn't make us a better process. Through meditation, we're continually teaching ourselves that perfection only exists in the moment. When we fully understand that, we start to live life joyfully. You may have moments when you look back at yourself and open up a stream of self-criticism. We can change this small and constricted experience of life with meditation, which gives us the confidence to live not as self-centered, but as centered in the self. When we break away from fear-based action, we can live a full expression of life. This week, we invite you to reflect on how you regard yourself and if your possessions and aspirations are contributing to an idealized sense of self, one perhaps which is motivated and curated by outside forces. Take some time to examine how often you're behaving as part of the desired product, rather than taking time to be in the process where you will have a richer experience. Do let us know how you get on. We'd like to hear from you. You can contact us at stories at the Vedic Conversation.com or post your story on social media with the hashtag the Vedic Conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and podcast and recommend us to your friends. Goodbye.